uh, about 1.2 billion people. In 2050, the estimates are that there will be twice as many people, which is 2.4 billion people. So just as we are interested in our eastern neighbors, which means the post-Soviet territory, just as we are interested in our southwest uh, east, uh, southeast neighbors, which is Balkans, the Balkans, we should be also interested in our southern neighbors, and that is the whole African continent. More so, even more so, because it's being increasingly destabilized. Unfortunately, we can see that very well. Well, very well. We can see that from the events in Sahel, which is uh, a belt of countries from Senegal to Ethiopia, in the narrow sense of the word, it's these five countries, Mali, Niger, Chad, Mauritania, and Burkina Faso. In this region, the greatest challenges are materializing, which the whole African continent is facing now. These are the climate change, the demographic growth, uh, inter-ethnic conflict between the nomad shepherds and the settled uh, farmers. All these things contribute to the destabilization of the region. And logically, Europe must be interested in this and European countries must be interested in this because just as we want we want uh, we are interested in the stability and prosperity of our neighbors we care about their well-beings in our immediate neighbors that we live next to we can apply the same principle to the to our neighbors from the African continent the Ministry of Foreign Affairs definitely doesn't want to paint Africa as a threat. Quite the contrary. For the fourth year, on the occasion of the traditional African Day in May, we've been organizing an international conference called the African Week, where we emphasize Africa as a continent of opportunities. So we are very happy, happy that the Yehlava International Documentary Film Festival and the Inspiration Forum has chosen the theme of Africa and called this whole debate Cool Africa. That's exactly how we see Africa. We see its potential, the young generation, the new technologies. All this is in our best interest and the best interest of all the other countries of the European Union. We should support that because that increases stability and prosperity of Africa and thereby our stability and prosperity as well. Is that enough? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, very well said. Thank you very much. We'll definitely come back to the more concrete things. So I'd be very happy if our other three guests could very briefly use their experience and stories to tell us as Czechs who may see, may consider African problems remote. To us Czechs, it may seem that Africa is a remote place of the world, part of the world. So could you please tell us, through your experience, why should we care about Africa? Hmm. Why is it important to care about Africa? So, what are the biggest uh, challenges that Mali is facing right now? Because we have uh, noticed uh, in the media as well the dramatic events 
there was a military coup d'etat. We know that Czech Republic has a foreign military mission in Mali. So could you please tell what are the greatest challenges and problems of your country and your region? Please, Mrs. Arkia, could you tell us? Uh, bonsoir, bonsoir à tous. Um, oui, effectivement, c'est vrai, you. récemment, nous avons connu un coup d'État. Yes, indeed, it's quite right that a coup took place recently in our country, um, which basically turned down the former regime, the former president, and now we're facing a situation which is threatening um, security in Sahel and as well in Mali specifically. Mali is defined as a place from which danger spreads into other countries, such as Burkina Faso or Niger. As noted earlier, a great challenge is security, because in uh, a place where there is no security, uh, we can't achieve anything, there can't be the the mutual exchange and the jihadi uh, threat is the biggest challenge we're facing. There are rebels here who threaten the whole country. We see conflict among the individual communities, which is harming the country a lot. On a daily basis, seven people die as a result of this conflict. So we have a big security problem in our country, and this puts our development at risk, the development of the whole country, that is. So what we need to do is that we need to realize that the jihadi threat is spreading to Burkina Faso, the neighboring country, and to Niger as well. Uh, we see victims of the jihadi attacks, and victims usually include civilian citizens, and we uh, need to uh, have our army uh, raise this conflict, so we try to, should strive to uh, eliminate this jihadi threat in Africa so that uh, Senegal, Mauritania and other countries are not contaminated by the current bad situation. So that's the general security situation that we see. Thank you very much. And let me ask Liva, who is also from Mali. And he is a PhD student at Charles University in Prague. Mali undoubtedly is a vital country for the Czech foreign policy. Um, uh, there is the foreign military mission active there. Uh, so uh, what's um, the perception of Mali um, uh, in the Czech Republic and the whole region, perhaps? So, Khalifa, the floor is yours. Very good. Very good evening to you all. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the floor. I believe that Czechs or the majority of Czechs do not really know Mali. However, the relations between Mali and the Czech Republic didn't start well, nowadays from uh, the beginning of our independent independence, we cooperated with Czechoslovakia, so even though the relations um, were not intense at one point in time, we were very happy to see a renewal of mutual relations between our countries. I study in the Czech Republic. In order to be able to come to the Czech Republic, I made use of one program that is co-financed by the Czech government. And thanks to that program, I could come here to the Czech Republic. I believe that relations between Mali and 
the Czech Republic should be more diverse, but perhaps that will come. Czechs should be interested in Mali because, as Arki has already mentioned, Mali is the center of problems that then spread across the whole Sahel. And if in one country there are some problems, people try to flee elsewhere and find home there or refuge there, which is not my case really, but it could be the case of others. When I uh, graduated uh, from the university in 2010, already back then the, the problems were quite intense, yet not as serious as there are now. Uh, uh, but back then it wasn't possible to study, for instance, I couldn't study in Pamakusa had to study elsewhere, so I had to go and study elsewhere. So that's why I sought other opportunities, and uh, this opportunity to study in the Czech Republic emerged. So what I want to say is that when the situation is bad somewhere, people have to flee, they're forced to flee. And as um, Nicole Adamsova has already mentioned, Africans or the whole African continent are direct neighbors of Europe. So if there are problems in Africa, it's for sure that these will have an impact on the European continent, cause migration, and aggravate very many other issues. When people are forced to leave their country, they go where they believe the situation is stable. And against this backdrop, we need to realize that stability from the African perspective lies in Europe, because that's the closest neighbor. So it means that people would want to go here. So we need to focus on one another, perceive one another, and we must not see ourselves mutually as enemies as somebody who's dangerous because that could cause numerous problems. If one group is stigmatized because, for instance, in their respective country there are some problems, it may at one point turn, which is not the case nowadays, yet we cannot leave people in a dangerous situation and do nothing. The minimum we can do is uh, try to help help people address the situation, tackle the problematic situation themselves. Uh, so nowadays I'm the, the Czech Republic, I pursue education here and once I complete my studies in the Czech Republic I'd like to contribute to the development of my country. I myself already started to act in this field so once I complete my studies I hope I'll be able to contrib contribute even more in this respect. Uh, the fact that I'm in the Czech Republic should perhaps be a case to motivate others and should send the message that the relations between the two continents shouldn't be just relations of remote neighbors, but rather relations of very close neighbors, because Europe is a continent that's closest to Africa. So if something doesn't work in Africa, people would want to flee Africa. And the first destination that they're going to go to will be Europe. So for that reason, um, Europeans need to take interest in Africa and vice versa, Africans need to take interest in Europe so that they know that even in Europe there naturally are certain issues. Mutual understanding will enable uh, mutual cohabitation and neighborhood. This, I believe, is an argument we need to disseminate so that everybody understands that we are geographically close and there is no reason why we shouldn't be close to one another as human beings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll ask Ify. I introduced you as an 
environmental artist. Uh, would you say that uh, currently when the whole world is facing many crises, should uh, countries such as Czech Republic care about problems on other continents and remote regions? When we look at the current pandemic of coronavirus, when you look at the climate change the whole world is dealing with or, or should be dealing with, when you look at the migration crisis from 2015 and 2016, do you think that these crises in quotes, could be positive in the sense that people realize that the problems of the whole world, global problems, should be something we should be dealing with here locally? Is that so? If it, please. Yeah, good evening again, and uh, thank you for having me here. I think your question is very important because uh, right now the world is a global village. There's no um, isolated country, no isolated community. We have a global community where everything seems to be working um, interactively. I think it's very important that for every country, like for Czech example that we're talking about, to actually deal with the global uh, issues in a very, um, uh, in a very local way, because uh, I believe that everything now that happens anywhere in the part of the world is a threat to every other part of the world. We're talking about climate change. Climate change is something that is a, a global pandemic in its own way, because if you're looking at issues about Africa and Europe, Czech Republic, the irregular migrations that we're having is usually caused by some of these um, pull factors dealing with immigration where you have the climate change, water security, uh, energy security. People are leaving their communities and trying to find places to uh, accommodate them themselves. So it's very important that Czech Republic looks at uh, global issues as local issues because uh, in a situation whereby uh, a country, a state, seems to have everything working to working very well for themselves and they seem to ignore issues happening or in some other parts of the world at a point it, those those issues will eventually catch up with this uh, safe um, environment so it's very important that you you deal with issues and that's why when you talk about United Nations talk about the world as a global village people have come to realize that where you are, your safe heaven could only last you for, you know, a, a, a period, a, a limited time, because the safe heaven may eventually become, you know, um, part of a larger problem. Because if you have issues where you have security in Europe, you have security in Czech Republic, you're not dealing with terrorism, you're not dealing with water security, you're not dealing with some of the conflicts. Uh, we, yeah, we, we have in other parts of the world, like in Africa, health issues and all that. At some point, definitely, it will catch up with, with uh, the safe places. You are having a lot of irregular migrations happening across uh, the Atlantic. People are finding where to go because of certain issues. And it's something that has to be dealt with. It's not uh, the, the, the policies, the foreign policies have to be very um, holistic in such a way that you can anticipate some of these things to happen because they're already happening. They may happen in a, in a very um, small measures at the moment, but if, it's, if, you, if uh, some of these secured countries don't contribute to solving some of these problems that are happening outside their countries, definitely it's, uh, it's a danger waiting to, to happen. And with the coronavirus, it has shown us that there is no, I mean, the world, the, the difference that we have now with Africa and uh, Europe, America, North America, and all these places are just a, an issue of demography. You know, we don't have borders anymore, actually. You know, uh, the, the, the virus have actually exposed that, you know, we, we live in a, in, in a, in a, 
in a world whereby um, something happening in Asia should consign somebody living in North America, you know, because at the end of the day, it's the, 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 the virus exposed the fault lines that we have, you know, because at the end of the day, you, you, you live in a safe environment, have uh, good education, good health system, good energy system, everything is secured and far off in other continents, they're having these issues. They may be remote to, you know, to you, to, to this particular safe place, but that remoteness will eventually become something that gets imported because the people there have to, you know, as uh, Khalifa said, people will always find where, you know, the pull factor will always get people out from their um, comfort zones to find where it's more comfortable for them to, you know, to make a home. So I think it's very important that uh, Czech Republic and every other country uh, in Europe and um, America or any of these places should actually start to look at uh, global issues in a, from a very domestic uh, point of view. Thank you, thank you, Ife. Nicole, I would like to ask you, as a representative of Czech uh, Foreign of Foreign uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, you've, you've heard several times that it's important for us to deal with. They aren't just a matter of the foreign countries. Uh, uh, Czech Republic has been uh, helping some prioritized African countries such as Zambia or Ethiopia, but we have a military mission in Mali. So how does the Czech Foreign Affairs Ministry choose where and how to help in other countries? How do you choose? I didn't hear a part of the question. I didn't have. A, I didn't hear you for a while, so I may be answering just the part of your question that I did hear. So, to continue what my colleagues have already said, it's clear from what they're saying that the problems that African countries are facing are very complex. They're complex, so. Therefore, the reaction and the assistance, the aid, must be very complex as well, so that these problems can be dealt with. We can deal with them together in cooperation. You mentioned partic the participation of the Czech Republic in the stabilization of the situation in Mali. Our soldiers have been stationed there since 2013. At, at the beginning of our engagement in the country, it was a military or security engagement, but gradually other aspects were added to it so that, so that our assistance in Mali is complex and sustainable in time. And so that it has a chance to truly contribute to a positive change in these countries. That is why we are trying to expand our humanitarian and development activities. As you mentioned, Czech Republic has long-term uh, two uh, priority countries in our foreign development program. It's Ethiopia and Zambia. Ethiopia is the key country I'll use this mention of Ethiopia to document what Ifi has already said. And Khalifa and Arkia actually mentioned that too. It's the migration of people inside Africa or African countries. In Europe, we sometimes think that all Africans who leave their homes 
in Africa look for new homes in Europe. But that isn't true. Most people in Africa migrate within the continent. And that, of course, causes problems to the host countries or communities. Ethiopia, to come back to our priority country for development co cooperation, Ethiopia, apart from its own 110 million people, Ethiopia hosts another million of refugees from other conflicts, other countries. Our second priority country, Zambia, is a stable country located in South Africa. And this also documents the fact that it's important to reinforce the stability of those countries which are significant, whether it's uh, demographic-wise, population-wise, or economy-wise, who then absorb a large part of the in, in, uh, migration that happens inside Africa. So uh, to answer your questions, uh, we assess our cooperation options in a complex way, and we try to make it long term. Ethiopia is my is our highest priority country. Uh, the second program period has been going on since 2010. We have a long relationship history from the period of Czechoslovakia, even from the period of the Ethiopian emperor, Zambia. We've been uh, having them on the top list for a shorter time. We've had them there for a short time, but we are striving for a long-term presence there as well. Sahel is our new focus. It's definitely our new a new focus for activities in Africa. And honestly, frankly, it is our highest strategic priority since the 1990s. Thank you very much for your response. And I do apologize for the sound problems that we have, sound interrupted. Um, when we tested it, it was fine, so probably it's the peak. Our climate change has been mentioned here, climate threat, a number of times as one of the examples that show that the whole world is interconnected and that it doesn't suffice to address issues just within the individual country but we need to address those issues across countries and across continents. In the Czech Republic, sometimes we hear the opinion, why should it be important for us to address climate change? Because it doesn't really affect us that much, with the exception of some pr protected uh, periods of drought. So I would like to ask uh, our if she could give us some specific examples, some specific uh, impact of climate change visible in Mali. Uh, can you tell us uh, what solutions are sought, not just at political level, but in society at large? Arkia, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, the truth is that we're facing climate change just like in most of countries worldwide. The main impact that we're seeing in Mali uh, pertains to agriculture, to farming. The economy of Mali and development of our economy um, uh, is based on farming and its development. 60% of people are involved in farming, the majority of citizens uh, involved in farming are illiterate farmers. So the impact of climate change on this sector is huge and we're witnessing um, an exodus of people from the rural areas, so especially young people uh, move away from the rural area. 
Uh, the young usually work in farming, they work in the field, they grow rice and thus provide food to others. And these young people, because of the impact of climate change, tend to leave the sector, so they leave farming for good. However, we need to realize that farming is crucial for food security purposes. And again, that's something that's linked to migration, as mentioned earlier. So because of climate change, many young people leave their homes and move away, even from Mali. So they move to Niger, they want to get to Europe or to another continent, then they send back their earnings to the community. And because of that, we don't have the workers to work in the fields, and this is a community-wide impact. There are very many impacts that we see. There are really numerous impacts. Uh, some are on health as well. Studies have shown that there are also public health issues caused by climate change. We indeed see victims of these public health issues that we're facing. Uh, there are numerous major impacts that the biggest impact is visible in farming because farming is crucial for the Mali community and for our economy. There are European countries that organize various um, programs uh, for help and uh, they strive to fight against climate change and help the communities in Mali. However, this isn't enough at this stage. Mali needs to be sufficiently equipped to be able to combat climate change. So we need education, among other things. Uh, certain European countries are already witnessing climate change as well and could help. Mali could bring a solution and Mali could provide funding and could also train our people. Uh, we in Mali need perhaps trainings much more than funding. We see a lot of money invested in various projects in our country. However, uh, Mali citizens are not sufficiently educated, so it won't be easy to arrive at a solution without education. In my opinion, and according to my experience, people need to be better educated to be able to face this situation. So that's that's the current situation in Mali. That's my comments related to climate change. Um, we have the Czech military uh, force active in Mali. Formerly there were troops there as well. Currently there is approximately 100 soldiers uh, joining other troops that uh, strive to fight the, the terrorists in Sahel, which is vital for the whole Sahel belt. The arrival of these troops uh, is something that is crucial and people expect to get support from the military troops and they hope that this will help to eradicate the jihadi threat in Sahel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, as we're discussing why it's important for the Czech Republic to look at what's going on, I forgot the organizers of the Inspiration Forum, the Mtihlava Film Festival, uh, did a survey in Yehlava and asked them what we have in common with Africa, whether there is anything in common with Africa. And I'd like to ask the Yehlava studio uh, if they can uh, actually give us the results of uh, this survey. Do we have anything com in common with Africa?
I'm sorry, I apologize. I have no sound. Est-ce que la question m'est adressée? Je ne sais pas trop. OK. I apologize, we have no sound, we hear nothing, so there's nothing I can tell you. stay in the Czech Republic and uh, if you're planning to come back to your home country what's the greatest in inspiration what would you like to bring back from Europe and on the other hand what should inspire us in the Czech Republic about Africa Khalifa please okay merci pour merci pour la question Thank you for this question. The inspiration I could bring back to Mali that technology, because I'm a scientist, I'm still studying, and the research techniques I've learned here, I will definitely bring those back to Mali. And as far as the other side is concerned, what Czech Republic could find inspir inspiring in Mali, um, perhaps its culture, because we have a very rich culture. And when I talk to people here in the Czech Republic, I try to share bits of our culture with them. For example, I tell them how people live in communities, how we live together, how people share when they are going through difficult times, how they support each other to get through these things. I've noticed here that people here have to rely on themselves. They can, for example, ask the government for help, but usually they have to do on their own. Usually they're not helped by their relatives, by their parents, they get no help from the community. But for example in Mali, a young person who doesn't work won't have to suffer that much because one of his brothers or maybe one of his cousins works and they can help them out they can help out their relative in need. So the one who is having problems can ask one of his relatives for help. This culture, I think it's something that would help very much here because the economy is structured in such a way that people have to do on their own. This brings productivity, productivity, but on the social level, I think that it creates a sort of a distance between people. So for that reason, 
the society isn't as cohesive here. People don't stick together that much. It's true that uh, the society is stable here because everybody takes care of, takes care of himself. But when people are facing uh, problems, people get so overwhelmed by their problem that even a small problem can throw people into depression. In Africa, there isn't that much depression, there aren't that many cases of depression because we live in communities. When you have a problem, you know you're not alone. There's always someone you can lean on when you have a problem. And I think that it does, isn't the case in this country, at least not that much. So that could be something that could inspire you. You could uh, draw inspiration from our community life. Otherwise, I think that inspiration can come from both sides, from Africa to here and from here to Africa. As we in Africa, look up to Europe, especially in technologies. We realize you're very advanced in technologies, and we are very interested in that because Africa is a continent with a huge potential, with a huge natural natural potential, but also, but its human potential isn't used enough. In order to use our human potential enough, more fully, we should get these technologies and start using them. So the inspiration as far as the direction from Europe to Africa goes, it's technology, and Europe could be inspired by our social structure. And use it to solve some of its problems. I think that depression is a huge problem in Europe. When I tell my friends, for instance, that in Mali or in Africa, we don't know what depression is, they are surprised. This could be actually explained by our community life. Everybody is helping everybody. We all help each other. Nobody is left alone. And when you get support from others, your problems don't weigh as heavily on you as when you have to face them on your own. This is just my personal analysis. Of course, I'm not a psychologist, but I think that this is this makes sense so i'm just thinking that this is could be inspirational inspiring for you in europe so when i was asking about inspiration i was asking khalifa you with your nigerian experience how do you see the coexistence of various ethnic, ethnic groups, uh, religious groups. How do Christians and Muslims live together in your country? What do you think the greatest problems are? What doesn't work? And on the other hand, what are the positive aspects of this? What does work well? And what should Europe or maybe the USA get inspiration from? Let's not talk about the negative things only. Ife, please, could you answer that? Yes. I think uh, one of the, um, Nigeria for one, let me just give you a quick background. Nigeria is a country of about over 200 million people, over 250 ethnic groups speaking different languages. And uh, we have three dominant groups, uh, ethnic, tribal groups. We have the Aosa, the Yoruba, and the Igbo. And we are evenly um, divided between the Christian community and the Muslim community, but the in the diversity, which ordinarily is our strength, we also have conflicts arising from that diversity, which uh, unfortunately has always been um, employed by the political class, you know, to um, hold on to um, political power, where you find um, Christians and Muslims having um, religious conflicts. And just a quick uh, drop back to what Khalifa said, Africa, not just Mali, Africa has uh, 
as a, a continent, as a, as, as a people, is very communal. We live very, you know, um, out for one another. So it's very unfortunate where, when the political class comes in to bring up these issues about religion, about ethnicity, about this and about that, trying to buy that rule. So that's been a very major issue that we have in Nigeria. But then in the diversity and in the positivity of that diversity, we have also seen our people coming together to um, demand for something better. Because for instance, we have an issue in Nigeria now, which got triggered by a hashtag called NSAS. SAS is a uh, a police unit, which is actually an acronym for Special Anti-Robbery Squad. And they've become notorious in just killing people in Nigeria, like extrajudicial killing and arrest and all that. And in the past three weeks, Nigerian, irrespective of religion, irrespective of cultural differences, have actually come together to have a protest for the past three weeks, where people are now demanding for reforms for better policing policies and all that so in the diversity sometimes you know the 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 nigerian people also look beyond the political class and they come together to demand for a change so in our diversity we've had issues we've had um, nigeria had a civil war which was uh, fought between um a section of the South, which is the Southeast, against uh, the Nigerian state. That was like 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago. So it's something that we've come out from different difficulties to embrace some um, positivity. Right now in Nigeria, we are in a, in a situation whereby um, the, the demography of the younger ones are much more than the older generation. So the dynamics is changing. A lot of people, and also with social media, a lot of people are not necessarily being drawn to um, old ways of doing things where it was mainly uh, entirely on which tribe are you, which religion are you. You know, that also depends or determines your position in the government or determines what you get from the government. But the growth of the youth is changing the dynamics, which is actually a positive thing for us in Nigeria. And in terms of uh, what can other nations also learn from Nigeria, I think it's our resilience, you know, because Nigeria, to be honest, we've got a lot of, we've, we've gone through a lot of series of setbacks to have numerous military coups. We've had a civil war, of course, and we've had bad leadership on and on and on. But, you know, our resilience, which at times seems to be very shaky, also has a kind of an elasticity that still gets us back to, you know, being a, 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 a disintegrated nation. Because it's very important, actually, for Africa and also for the rest of the world that Nigeria stays very stable. Because we're talking about a situation where you have a population of 200 million people being displaced. You know, all, the, all throughout the Sahel, all throughout the African continent, and of course, our neighboring European states will not be left out. So it's also very important to look at this from an angle where um, everybody should actually, you know, have it in, in the back of their mind that Nigeria um, problems is actually one that concerns everybody. Just like we had in Mali, the queue, Nigeria is also playing a very important role in trying to. Um, get that issue, you know, very well settled. And I believe that a lot of countries, because of our um, diverse diversity, uh, a lot of countries should learn from from our our uh, ability to absorb all this. Talking about climate change, climate change is something that has triggered a very unfortunate crisis in Nigeria, where we have the headsmen and the farmers um, crisis because of water security in uh, up north, not having enough water, 
water being uh, relatively abundant in the south, the headsmen coming to the south, invading farms and all that. Sometimes this um, boils to a, a, a certain space where you think that something, uh, Nigeria is about to disintegrate because really we, we, we have very delicate lines. But like I said before, our resilience had always been the one holding us you know, together. So I think it's something that some countries should be able to, to learn. We don't have, uh, I, I can't tell you that we have a, a very definite or a better way of solving issues, but just sometimes it just naturally settles itself and you know we, we move on again. But the issue about climate change in Nigeria, it's not something that has been very um, encouraging because one, a lot of people think it's an elitist um, discussion that climate, actually elitist and also living in denial that climate change doesn't exist. But with the headsman and the farmers crisis, people are actually beginning to see that it's not elitist and it does exist. So it's something that we've been able to have um, a very in, uh, unfortunate incident with, but we a lot of. I very much apologize to interrupt you, but I would like to ask one more thing. I would like to ask Arkia, if I may, because I would like to ask this, Arkia, if you could tell us. One thing that ideally the Czech Republic could do or European Union could do for Mali. So please, uh, let's put aside what's happening now. What could they do? What do you think that we could do for you? What would be the most important thing? Uh, <laughs> I believe that I can put it very clearly. Nowadays, the most important thing for Mali and for the citizens of Mali is peace and security. Everything that could help Mali find peace, situation and security and restore that back again is the most crucial thing because security is indeed our biggest issue that we're struggling with. We don't need to seek that long to find and identify the issue. So without having security, we wouldn't be able to find other issues. So at present, local citizens feel the urge to restore security. They live in a dangerous situation in the north. Communities are forced to leave their homes. On a daily basis, we see that situation happening. And on a daily basis, civilians are dying. They are targets of armed attacks carried out by groups of jihadis. So that's the biggest issue. This is what is the most painful thing at present. It is quite normal that people like Khalifa leave the country, want to study elsewhere, and then to return back to Mali, hoping to find peace there, and hoping to be able to use the skills they gain abroad. So what we would appreciate most in this context would be peace and security. The Czech Republic and Europe at large should therefore try to act in this respect so that local citizens can get out of this crisis that has been taking place since 2012 already. Because of this crisis, we're unable to live our lives. Even though there was this coup in August, we're still facing danger. We still see a dangerous situation. People are unable to lead normal lives. 
It's not possible to address the needs of citizens. It's not possible to allow the country to develop when danger uh, reigns the country. It's impossible to implement projects, all kinds. Without having security in place, nothing can be implemented at all. We used to be a wonderful country. We had an influx of tourists, but no tourists come anymore. If a European decides to go to Mali, others tell him or her, no, don't go there, it's dangerous. Mali, Sahel, is a forsaken area. Local citizens know that there are foreign military troops, but that is not enough because, well, there is the Barkan French mission. We have other military units here from Europe. However, in spite of that, there is still danger. We can't get out of that crisis. So perhaps it would be worth the while to find new strategies, seek new strategies of how to combat jihadists a lot. Uh, is, um, uh, you know, this is discussed a lot over here. Uh, but basically, people think here yeah, there is no hope and that they should rather negotiate with the jihadis and find a solution with them. In spite of the presence of foreign troops, it's not possible to get rid of the danger. So what can we do? What must be done? We probably need to focus on some other strategies, seek new ways of how to help Mali, because the operations carried out on spot don't really bring any results. So nothing has changed so far, and we are basically plummeting deeper and deeper down, and local citizens are losing hope. So that's all I can say about the theme. The Czech Republic, however, has uh, taken an important step in this respect. Um, Nikola Adamsova has mentioned that the troops have been in Mali for several years, cooperation has been renewed. There are also other um, foreign military troops that help Mali find, fight the danger it's facing. I would like to highlight one more thing. We must not forget the youth. We must listen to the voice of the youth because this is full of hope. It's the hope for our country. If jihadis are to remain here and if danger is still here, it will be problematic because the youth is facing not just this danger but poverty as well. It's not easy to live in such a country. So that's why everybody, well, I mean the youth, is uh, fleeing Mali. I do apologize to jump in. Uh, we don't have much time left, so I would like to ask Nicole Adamsova from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs if she can just very briefly respond to one question uh, that has appeared on my Facebook profile. Mr. Jonas Mikl still asking, good evening. I would like to ask if the Czech Republic will be closing down further embassies in Africa or rather open new embassies. So are any changes envisaged? in this respect. So can I ask Nicole to very briefly answer this question? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. We believe that um, uh, no further closings down are scheduled. It's rather the opposite trend that we're seeing, um, as I've described, the rising importance of Africa in Czech foreign policy and as our foreign guests friends have described how complex the issues faced by Africa are. Uh, so in the near future, in the mid term, we are considering uh, in what countries we may open new embassies. In Sub-Saharan Africa, at present, we have nine embassies. Just to illustrate, let me say that in 1989, Czechoslovakia 
at 16. Uh, uh, is there any specific plan to which embassies or which countries or has that not been decided as yet? Let me mention Bamako, uh, the Mali embassy that we opened in October 2019. and. In the near future, we don't have anything specific scheduled, um, but we indeed are contemplating the broader Sahel region, so interconnection uh, with, um, uh, with with that region. Uh, so, so the ambition is, but not no specific plans. Yes, indeed, if I understand correctly. So, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for this debate. We could be discussing Africa for many more hours, but thank you very much to everybody for uh, your ideas. Uh, and let me say that Cool Africa um, is certainly not closing as yet. We'll have another debate starting at 2030. Um, the title of that debate will be What's Moving Africa. I'd like to thank all the followers um, online. I do apologize for the technical issues we had. I'd like to thank the guests once again for sharing their ideas and experience. Enjoy the rest of the evening. And and uh, let me ask, uh, if we can have the survey uh, once again, if we have the sound. So that was the survey, like what do we have in common with Africa? So that will close the debate. Thank you once again and enjoy the rest of the evening. So do we have anything in common with Africa? We're people, we're sharing one planet, well, not one continent, one planet, so we're very, very close. Uh, they are our neighbors. Together with Africans, we inhabit planet Earth, so we are co-responsible for how we do that. We have uh, common foreign relations, common trade, and very many other relations. As Europeans, definitely we have something in common. We colonized Africa in a major way, and then Americans, uh, uh, who are the descendants of European colonists, also um, colonized African countries, so uh, they, they took slaves from there. We live on the planet, we are human beings, so we have things in common. We have uh, our pockets full of our uh, mobile phones and tablets, etc., and uh, all the well, elements of these uh, phones come from Africa. So whoever has these gadgets um, basically contributes to the exploitation of the raw materials uh, and um, social structures. Africa is the motherland. There are movements and people out there and uh, uh, politicians who constantly push the motto back to the motherland. <laughs>